So today, uh, I have the pleasure to talk about no code. And uh, the key question I'm trying to answer is, uh, does no code mean we don't need any engineers anymore? And what I'll try to do is I'll uh, try to uh, present you some learnings that I did the hard way uh, about this question. So uh, probably you can just try to sit down and answer it, uh, ask people around it, or you can try it out like, like I think I did and we did um, at Get Safe. And I wanted to tell uh, to tell you uh, like how this went actually. Um, so let's get started. Uh, introduction already happened. Uh, I'm Conrad. I freshly joined Peritos and have been at GetSafe before. So all around the uh, Heidelberg um, startup scene, and I'm super happy that there's also a, a Heidelberg um, product tank. Um, still, we need to grow the community, as we can see, but. Uh, Let's all work, work towards that. And why I've ultimately chosen to talk about no code is um, like for one reason is that we use it extensively at Get Safe. And I want to, as I said, uh, tell you a bit about how this went and what we what I've learned and especially learned uh, as a product person and as a product manager. Um, but also, it's a huge hype topic, right? And what I brought to you here is. Um, a view on some uh, expert report done in 2020 about the future of no code. And obviously, this is just guessworking, but this is how ambitious the no code community is, right? They, if you look at the top right, they predict that uh, within now it's like four or five years, we'll see the first uh, real IPO that's purely like with a product that's purely based on no code. Uh, I think that's very like ambitious, and uh, obviously it's done by a company Adalo that's also a no-code tool, so might have some bias here, uh, those people. But still, I think it's uh, super interesting to look into and uh, try to understand how this specifically uh, can help us in everyday product work. And uh, that's what I'm trying to answer today, and hope it helps you. So. Let's get started and first try to answer what specifically no code is. And I try to bring a very uh, like uh, simple definition. And for me, no code is basically being able to build something without code that before was only possible uh, to build via coding. And this is very general, but I think it's also kind of correct. And uh, I think if you put it that way, uh, no code is not really new also. I think like the first, I don't know, Apple computer or Photoshop, those are also no-code tools, right? Uh, before that, you weren't able to do some specific tasks on yourself without coding. After having like a really UI uh, 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 with the Apple computer or being able to edit photos, you were able to do things without having to be hands on any code um, for yourself, right? And that actually changed a lot. And there. I think currently this is something similar ongoing, like a wave of tools that allow to uh, to kind of get to a new uh, range of products that you're you will be able to build without really touching code. Hopefully, maybe um, that wouldn't be possible before. And this uh, trend has been ongoing or reviving within the like last, I'd say, like two three years. And actually, no code is also uh, closely connected to low code, and today I'm going to talk uh, about both. And I think both areas are like coming together closer and closer. And in the end, it's you know it's not black and white, but it's rather a scale of how much code do I need to do to uh, do a specific uh, task. Um, and on the other hand, obviously, is are is like fully coded software, right? Where you need to do anything in code. But if we want to be specific, I think also just having packages in programming, like where some function is, you can just go to Git and get your package for something. That's also some kind of no code, right? Because you don't need to code it yourself. So borders are not really sharp. And today, uh, I'll talk about mostly what today would be called no code or low code tools. And just to give you an impression, like how big the scene and the landscape is, I brought one of those like common and usual landscape pictures. We can just see like a massive amount of tools, and it's, I guess, it's uh, completely outdated by now because it's already uh, more than one year old. 
Um, and you probably find a logo of a tool that you've already used in some context. And also, there's a wide range of, uh, you know, between just very small tools for, to, uh, for a very specific task and massive enterprise software tools um, on this map, on this landscape. So this is, it's not like one stack and one tool, but it's a range of tools that uh, actually help you doing things without uh, the need to heavily uh, code. And that, and that's one of the key points also I want to make today, if you know how to stitch them together, you can build very powerful uh, stuff in, in quick time. Um, and those tools, actually, they ride the wave and they promise a lot, right? So they basically promise that you don't need any engineers anymore, um, which obviously is, is, is quite a promise. And what I would like to do in the next section is basically um, tell you of some uh, applications that we actually had at CatSafe, um, give you a bit of a like even live demos of some uh, of some tools, and talk about the learnings that um, we and especially I had uh, during that time and what I think that should mean for uh, how to use low code as a as a PM. So, question is. Uh, do we, is there no need for engineers anymore? And let's try to answering it by looking into specific examples. So what um, I wanted to first is I want to give you an introduction to the stack that we used. And I'm just going to drop some tools, but I think it's important for you, especially if you have never uh, worked with no code to just um, uh, get, get, get warm with some of the names and maybe uh, after that talk, I highly encourage you to just check out uh, some of the tools. Most of them are just like use your Google sign up uh, and you can start right away and you can do uh, pretty exciting stuff in, in a few minutes. So one of the key uh, tools that we used was um, Sapier. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of an older tool in, in, uh, in no code and it basically lets you connect uh, any two tools that you can think of and perform very basic data operations. We'll look into Sapier in a second. Um, what we also used is uh, Superblocks. It's a newer tool. We know it from a like basically contact from a friend of the company. And Superblocks is kind of similar to Zapier, but it's it's like more heavy in terms of what you can uh, what you can put in as custom code in there. Right? Plus, it has a huge advantage. You can just create APIs, which um, which is pretty awesome. And I'm going to show it also to you in a second. Um, what we also used is Retool. Um, this ha is a tool that has seen, seen I think, uh, ma massive growth and adoption. And this is basically a tool that lets you, like, per track and drop, create any internal tool that you can think of. Um, then we've used uh, Customer Own. Uh, it's a nice tool that's intentionally for uh, automating CRM. Um, but you can, what you can also do with it, you can coordinate complex workflows, right? So we, uh, it's intended to be used in CRM, but we also use it to coordinate uh, workflows within other tools because it has nice, like you can imagine, like uh, you can track and drop like a ca campaign flow, uh, sending emails and text messages and stuff. But you can also use it to basically put in blocks of other tools that should do something, right? And uh, as I said, create workflows. And last but not least, I think one of the um, the bigger tools that we use is Segment, which is pretty cool because it's basically a customer data platform. It allows you to uh, it unifies any kind of customer data um, or data on any customer behavior and lets it easily share with other tools. And more or less, um, we've built a lot of applications on top of that stack. Um, and uh, I think we had around. I'd say like 50 to 100 internal applications running on that stack um, all alone, right? So quite quite powerful and heavily used. And just to give you some idea of what we did with it, actually, and what you can do with it, um, the first thing I think is it's rather boring, but it's still important, is some basic monitoring, right? So we used it, and I'm going to show an example in a second, to monitor customer reviews, something that like everyone uh, that does a product should should somehow do if it's a product that customer review about. Um, we monitored services, uh, errors, and uptime. We also monitored sales, except, especially when we had a product launch. 
um, of, a, of a new product. It was important to kind of feel the initial uh, traction of that. And we had just a Slack channel monitoring sales. Um, and we also did that by uh, using using uh, no-code tools, especially Zapier, a lot. Um, then we had a whole range of uh, internal tools that we, we've built. Um, like two of them, just to mention, are coupon code management, going to show you some, some stuff around in a second, and a lot about um, automating sales operations, right? And just to give you an impression, I think that just around automating sales operations, we had uh, like a couple of hundred probably automations up and running, right? And um, last but not least, and I think uh, most exciting, we also had some real customer facing features um, or fully fledged features uh, run on no code. And um, one I want to show you later is uh, an offer calculator. Um, another thing is a one click contract cancellation service. So, what you may be like Germans know from Abo Alarm, uh, we basically rebuild it. Uh, so you could like uh, s sign one checkbox, look next, and we would cancel your old contract. And we built stuff like a switcher service where with one click you could switch like from an old insurance to new insurance. Right? So it it sounds easy and it it felt easy to the customer, but actually there have been a lot of things involved in the back. And all of that were built on top of uh, no code. And um, what I'd like to do next is I want to show you some specific examples and how we actually did it. So let's jump into customer reviews. And as I said, I think everyone, uh, every product manager sh should somehow uh, do customer review management. And what we did is like, uh, like start as a very basic thing. It was basically okay after I don't know a customer talked to a service agent or a customer service um, a colleague, they could rate their experience with five stars, typical CSET uh, rating, right? And um, then of course questions like where do you save them? Usually you have like a third party tool to collect it. And what we just um, did is we used Zapier to create some kind of uh, logic on top of what, what the customer actually rated. And this is actually not 100% how we implemented it, but it 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 pretty much depicts uh, what the logic here was, right? So for one and two star reviews, for example, we could we would just like uh, send it to Slack, right? And notify people because this usually hints on something is going wrong, right? Very bad review. Um, hopefully the customer also stated a reason for that and someone should look into. And then in Slack, we could do the usual review operations, tag someone who takes care of that, follows up with the customer, sees if there has been like a technical error and so on and so forth. Um, usually with like mid reviews, we would do uh, nothing much uh, as of saving them into the database and doing analytics off top of that. But, and that's very interesting, what you can easily do with such no-code tools is um, we would ask the customer to, um, if the customer gave us five stars, so uh, had a very good experience, uh, we would ask them to actually rate us in the App Store, right? Which is cool because we know, hey, there's a very happy customer. Why don't we uh, try to use that momentum and ask the customer to give us a good rating in the App Store, which then like hopefully, uh, and organically attracts um, other people. And how that actually, uh, like the setup looked like, I want to show you in the live demo right now. So you really got to see how that how that feels. So give me a second. I need to share some other screen. Just want to make sure I pick the right one. That's actually the same screen. So can someone give me a sign if they see some other screen right now? Zay no, we just see yes. one screen. Ah, you see, you see Zapier right now, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So um, as I said, um, we did this with Zapier, and uh, this is how Zapier looks like. I uh, hope you understand I'm not using uh, the Zapier account of especially get save as my former employee, but that's my private account. Um, but I set up a uh, basically um, a Zap. That's how like one entity in Zapier is called. That's pretty uh, pretty similar to what we did. And what I can see here, there are a lot of things you can do, but the main thing is you can create Zaps. And what a Zap is, 
um, is basically, you can do that right now, um, is just something that waits for a trigger, uh, for example, a new uh, event in your calendar, a new contact, a new file in some folder on Google Drive, a new slide, a new slide deck, whatever, right? So there are thousands of triggers that you can, uh, predefined triggers that you can choose off. Uh, then you can do some transformation with the data you get in there, whatever it is, right? And you can perform an action. So you can, for example, send it somewhere else, right? That's the basic idea of Zapier. And it's quite powerful. And how that example that I showed you with customer reviews would look like, uh, could look like, is, is like this. So uh, let's say we collect those reviews in a Google form, right? So we would send that out or embed it somewhere, and people would rate us uh, one to five. And you can just uh, select here, hey, let's go to Google Form, uh, wait for a new form rec um, response. So someone send in their review. Then I'm going to choose my account. Cool. Um, I got to choose the form. So those are all the forms that I have. I'm going to choose CSET, and I can test the trigger. right? And testing the trigger just pulls in some sample data, and I can use it by then. So I somehow can see that, OK, this seems to be the rating. There is a one. And this seems to be the comment, right? And what you can see here is a typical thing of like no no code tools. They are not really like aware of possibly how I named those uh, those forms in uh, in Google Forms. So they just got use the internal ID, right? So there's always some you know some uh, guess working and some uh, nitty gritty details um, involved here. But I mean it works fine. And what I would then do is I would create. Uh, path, and that's a predefined action. So I can basically say, hey, uh, let's see. Um, if how did you like it is less than three, so one or two star rating, then do something like send us channel message Slack. OK, it's just all pre predefined. I choose an account. Uh, I choose a channel. And I can just use the data from basically the trigger that I had, so the uh, form response. Like, how did you like it? Uh, who sent it? Didn't get data here. And what did you like or not like? The app was loading so slow. And I can just use it here as kind of parameters and uh, variables and put it in, right? And I can do a lot of things like king with a, a nice icon uh, and so on. And uh, click Continue. And I can test the action. I did this yesterday, right? And there was a nice message in Slack. And uh, then I can go back and I can do the same for three four-star reviews and for five-star reviews. I can basically uh, create, for example, an event in customer O, which would be send an email and ask for App Store rating. And once I'm done and tested it, I can just click Publish. Doesn't work because I I'm not connected to some of the tools right now, but that's as easy as it is, right? So it literally takes you like probably 10 minutes to set that up, and it's I think quite a powerful uh, workflow already. Cool. Um, so hoping that you can see still my presentation. Yes, I would like to go into one other um, tool that we've built on top of NoCode that's a bit more advanced, but also not so much advanced, but that had a huge impact uh, for us. And that next one would be uh, coupon code management. So imagine, um, and uh, this is like somewhere on the GetSafe uh, website, you can enter a coupon code. And, and that's typical, you know, uh, e-commerce or anything, anything you can buy, where you can buy something online, you usually can add a coupon code and you get like a discount if you got referred by a friend or uh, got like into a special sale or whatever and we also had that. And obviously, once someone enters in uh, the coupon code and clicks apply, uh, we want to have some, uh, you know, validations up and running. Uh, so first of all, we want to know, like, does the code, whatever uh, customer entered, still exist and is still valid? And if so, what's actually coupon hate, right? So is it 10 euro discount or 15 euro discount? I don't know. And we'd like to know, is it a referral or not, right? So do we need to connect it somehow to, to another person in our database? And um, what we did like historically we implemented this by using a third-party tool that completely took care of that right um and 
I, I wouldn't mention the name, but you can see it here. It's a, a promotion engine, uh, quite a fancy tool that can do a lot more, but we only needed basically this kind of validation and coupon code management uh, functionality. And what happened is that one day they told us that they would increase their price. So we'd need to pay like a six, six figure uh, euro amount per year, which we thought is way, way, way too, um, too expensive to keep it running like that. Right, and so uh, we we thought about like, hey, what, what can we do about it? And this actually uh, happened in um, one of the squads that we had, and they decided to base it on no code. And I would like to show you how such an implementation can look like, and how easy it is to build this functionality, which uh, might have been worth uh, uh, like a six figure uh, euro amount to some other company, um, which we could basically save. Uh, with us. So um, the tools that we used um, was basically super blocks to create an API, because obviously our funded needs to talk to an API, and to um, do the code management. What we actually used back in the days was retool, but I but I, I thought like it's it's way easier in super blocks. So I'm gonna show you a super box implementation in a second. And we just used Google Sheets as a as a database. And I'm now gonna jump over to share yet another screen to show that to you. Just give me a second. Very interactive presentation here. OK. And you should see. We see super blocks. Yes, super blocks. Awesome. So let's jump. Right into so what you can see is uh, super blocks yet another UI of a no code tool, and what you can do here is you can create applications and workflows which basically uh, is an API or some scheduled jobs. Right, and it's pretty cool. As I told you before, this is a no code tool that's more like leaning towards low code and allowing for a bit more code, and sometimes that's really really handy. And yes, I'm implementing a pizza dough calculator uh, on my own. But uh, other than that, let me show you like what this uh, basically coupon code validation API could look like. Um, also, I built up a database, which is basically a Google Sheet. And what I did there is I just uh, said, hey, there probably are some codes. They have a validity, uh, like they're expiring at some uh, some um, point in time, and they have an amount. right? So that's the basic information I need to store somewhere. And let's see how this API looks like. So what I can do here is, uh, and I can show you how easy it is to set it up. So let me set up a new API, workflow, next, and there it is, right? Um, so now I could use this uh, API to do something, right? So it's really literally two clicks. I did this here, and I defined some variables. So I think the front end will send like the actual code and a date, like today's date, basically. And what I want to do is I want to give back the information whether this code is actually in our database and if it's valid. Right? And um, so what I can do here is I can add steps um, to this API workflow. Um, you can see there are like, a lot of things I can do. I can uh, add more resources, integrations somewhere else. But I basically added Google Sheet. So the first step I'm going to do is I'm going to read the whole uh, spreadsheet, which is code demo. So this basically uh, loads uh, the data that I have here into Superplux. What I then did, like I could do a lot of things, but I found it most easy to just write some custom Python code. Yes, this could be also done with other low-code tools, what I'm doing here. Um, but knowing how most of them work, I think it, it was most easy to just do it in, in, uh, in some code, right? So I would basically, I'm not, I'm not gonna go through code, but I basically look like, is there a code? If not, then let's return code not found. If there is a code, check, uh, check the validity, like the expiry, and tell me if it's valid or not. Right, and that's that's basically it. And what I can do uh, based on that, I can uh, now use this API. And sorry, I need to share my window again. Otherwise, it's you're not going to see the effect. Um, there you go. What can you do then is 
you can use this API and like in production, right? It's it's literally a few clicks and a few lines of code, and I can now ask this API to, hey, if I have the winter sale coupon, like what what actually happens? And it says me, okay, the code is valid and the amount is 15 euro, right? So it just gives me the entry of that of that Google Sheet. I can also enter, I don't know, some other sale, uh, sale 100. I don't know. It's not in the table, right? And it gives me code not found. So it's it's literally as as easy as this. That obviously, no, I'm. Uh, this should be a developer's job, but uh, I hope you saw like how easy it is to literally replace a tool that. Uh, would otherwise have cost uh, a big amount of money, right? It takes a few minutes uh, to set this up. And what you can uh, do as well, you can build a nice UI around uh, very easily around that Google Sheet and uh, let people create new codes, edit codes, delete codes, right? They can either do it in Google Sheets or then use the nice UI. But it's all, all like a few clicks away. And to continue in the presentation, you got it. Yeah, you should be able to see it. So that was super easy and actually had a huge had a huge impact. Last but not least, what I want to uh, not show you in in real, but I want to uh, give you an idea on is the actually that's wrong. I want to show you uh, and talk about the offer calculator, and this is something that gets a bit more intricate, right? But let me get you down to the idea. So. What we saw that um, oftentimes um, our customers uh, at GetSafe, they would be on the phone with customer service agents. Um, and the usual con conversation would go like that. And on the left, it's a customer. On the right, our, our agent is uh, that a customer on the phone, like they would call for something totally different. But I would ask, hey, I'm interested in a contest insurance. Um, how much would that actually be? Right? And our service agent back in the days, they would say, well, yeah. Actually, please go to the app, calculate a price, and buy it there. Right, and that's that's cool uh, because the basic idea uh, was and is to be, be able to build a digital insurance, um, so to not sell it over the phone or wire or paper. But still, it happened quite often that people just ask on the phone, right? And uh, like to give you more context, um, and this is very interesting from a product perspective and strategy perspective. We saw that a lot of KPIs like metrics. Uh, of people that had very positive uh, customer service interactions um, went up, right? So uh, by creating very nice service interactions, we could actually uh, do something good for over, overall numbers, right? So good experience uh, must not only be digital, but also good physical or like human touch experience can lead to good things for both like the customer and the company. But actually, we never really built this feature of um, uh, like our service agents being being able to uh, to buy something or offer something over the phone, so customers mostly would say, "Okay, sure, we'll do on the phone, right?" And then actually, they they never really did, right? So uh, as you all know, like buying insurance uh, might be pain, and if you you often procrastinate, and we just saw this opportunity, knowing all about the context, to actually validate if people would be willing to if we can give them like an offer actually on the phone to be more willing to buy an insurance, right? And so what we needed to do, we need to build uh, something where our customer service agent could uh, calculate an offer for the customer at hand and send out the offer and uh, so that the customer uh, best case in almost real time could uh, do some you know check marks uh, on their phone and after a few clicks have the insurance in their in their app. Right. And actually, this is what we were able to do after only two days of no code. Right. So we were able to build all of this functionality within uh, two days, which I think is really, really rapid. And I think up to today, it's just working in production. Um, and this is how uh, probably a very uh, good conversation would go uh, right now. Right. So people would really be able to give uh, to send an offer, our service agent. Uh, I got save and uh, receive the offer via email. Uh, people would just see it. They need to do some legal check marks, uh, but then be able to buy it. And what I wanted to show you, just not like actually how it looks like in the tool, but how our tool setup looks like. And I think that also is a good bridge towards uh, kind of the end of my talk, basically what, what 
I and we've learned from using so much uh, no code. So the main application was written in Retool. I told you it's uh, it's a tool to build internal uh, to build internal tools, and this is how it roughly looks like, right? So you have like a pane where you can track and drop uh, UI, and you can connect the UI, and you see that in the lower part to databases, you can apply some logic between the UI elements. It's it's somewhere between no code and a bit of coding, so it's I'd say it's low code, but it's very intuitive and super fast and super nice, right? And we use it to build like an operator UI. Um, what we then did is we let this tool connect with our backend APIs and Google Sheets, which was a database of the offers that we send out, because we quickly noticed, uh, even before launching, that it would be important to have some kind of record of what we actually send out, because this might also be actually like we can't just send out inference offers, right? We somehow need to uh, save that this happened. And um, the backend APIs were just to like get prices, right? So there has been, that's this cool thing, have been REST APIs to get prices. Um, so we were able to, to uh, connect to that via, via Retool. What we then did is we, uh, like the, you would imagine like the customer service agent, they calculate like an offer in the tool, tell the price to a customer, customer says, yes, that would be cool, it's only four euros per month. And then uh, the, the service agent could hit the button like, hey, send it to the, to the customer. What we then do is we would forward this to Zapier, which uh, connects tools and to segment, uh, right? Why two tools to do data forwarding? Because it was just handy at the time to have it in both tools. And in Zapier, you can do some basic formatting. And those tools basically connected to Customer.io, uh, send out an email to the customer in, in near time, so almost real time, and to some other tool I didn't talk about yet, but it's basically, it's Hayflow. It's a, a small, uh, young tool that lets you like configure a uh, simple, um, uh, and nice online like checkout flows, right? To give this legal consent. So the customer had everything they need in their email. We um, and they could uh, say yes to the offer. And what we had to do then is basically get that data back and the response back and uh, give status updates to our people in Slack and um, pass it back to some analytics tool to see how many people actually uh, clicked the offer and checked out. Uh, like so. Um, Sorry, uh, bought the insurance, right? So as you can see, uh, ultimately the customer experience was just quite nice and smooth and fast. Um, but this like tool or application was not that easy anymore. We we're still able to do it in like two days with basically one two uh, people, but it took quite an amount of uh, tools involved and quite some knowledge about the systems and the tools involved. Um, so that's at the more advanced end of uh, using no code, I'd say. So um, having told you about some applications, and I hope you learned some things and want to uh, try it out yourself, I want to give you some idea of like what actually went well, uh, what did we learn from it, and what went not so well. So uh, for me, after all, uh, using no code, um, I think the, the one of the major advantages is it's really rapid, right? And I know there, you know, you learn in all those like product uh, uh, product um, courses and schools, you know about, you learn about rapid prototyping and how cool it is and so on and so forth. And I've done that also in, uh, especially with like my corporate uh, years uh, in, in, in product. And usually rapid means, uh, like a couple of weeks or maybe month, right, to build a really functional uh, prototype. And often if it's not functional, some people still call it rap, um, prototype, but it's actually like pen and paper, uh, I'd say like mock-up at most or wireframe. And you don't really get the same level or quality for response, right? And I think uh, with no, like using no code, we are actually able to do some, some real rapid prototyping and build fully functioning uh, features or prototypes slash products within hours and not weeks or months, right? So that's really cool. It just gives you a time advantage. And the second thing is, uh, I think, and uh, I mean, it's connected, but it really takes out the guesswork. And uh, I want to boil it down to having seen something in production uh, makes it way easier to know it's the right thing. And it's connected to the whole prototyping idea I think it's nice and it's also what you learn like in product school 
uh, and on, on on nice slides that yeah, I mean, go out and validate. I think and but don't get me wrong, it's totally correct uh, asking questions, showing like pictures and stuff. But there's nothing that replaces a real test in production, to my experience, because you always learn something that you didn't expect. And the faster you're out in production with something, the faster you you got to learn. Right? Um, and you can be sure, like, take out the risk that your product fails or your feature fails and know that you're building the right thing. And, and I think that's very special to know code. Um, and especially as a PM, having built it yourself uh, makes it way easier to know how to build it right. Um, you know, and this is something um, that's debatable. I hope to have a, a like discussion later on. But I think for me personally, having like literally pushed data from left to right, it's way easier to afterwards talk to an engineer how to implement it uh, correctly, right? Because they know about all of the pitfalls about the edge cases because I have experienced it myself, right? And it makes product delivery afterwards um, uh, like way more effective, I think. So I think those are two really, really big advantages. And uh, that's why uh, I think most like all of UPMs should uh, go out and learn some no coding and know how, when and how to use it. But there are also some uh, risks and challenges attached. And most of them, to be honest, I and we learned the hard way. So what was not so compelling about the whole thing? And the first problem that I and challenge that I want to bring you is what I'd call the invisible barrier problem. And it's very interesting because as I said, you like it, it takes you very low effort to build uh, amazing things. But at some point in time, it might be that a really random barrier appears and it's really, really high, right? And taking the a very, very, seemingly simple next step takes a huge amount uh, of effort, right? So we're taking like you're on there and you're developing something. It takes like each minute you're making progress and then bam, the invisible barrier comes and uh, some seemingly simple step uh, will take two days to solve, right? And you can't really know when it appears because it's really specific to the tool uh, that, that you might be using. And to bring you some examples, I did some memes, uh, obviously. So uh, some of like very basic examples are the path that I just showed you in Zapier, right? Like the uh, go go way A, B, or C. Uh, this is easy to append to a, to a zap uh, on the end um, of your current workflow. It's impossible. You can see it in a screenshot to append it in between. Right, so if you build your uh, zap with like I don't know, like twenty steps, and this happens quite often, and then you want to build in like a um, uh, if then uh, thing, if else thing uh, in the middle, you're basically spoiled and need to start all over and manually recreate because you also can't copy paste, right? And this takes might take hours. Um, some other examples um, that I experienced myself, like attaching a PDF to an email, super easy. Then you go live and you notice, OK, for some legal reasons, you got to encrypt the PDF. Uh, what the heck? How do I even do this? Right? And this is the invisible prayer. So it might be a simple next step, like seemingly simple next step, but it's almost impossible to do. And then you got to switch to some more code heavy tools and need to somehow figure it out. Another thing is uh, selecting from like a Google Sheet, like a row based on one condition, super easy. Uh, selecting a, a Google Sheet row based on two conditions, almost impossible, right? Heavy coding involved for whatever reasons. It's a design choice of the tools, but you don't know it uh, upfront if you don't um, know the tools very well. And last but not least, and that's that's one of my favorites, I, uh, favorites I experienced myself in Zapier, uh, like looping over 500 entries uh, of whatever you're doing. Super easy, looping over 501 entries, it's almost impossible, it's a huge pain, right? And how would you even know? It's Yes, it's somewhere in the documentation, but how would you even know, right? You don't expect it, and uh, if your list is longer than 500 entries, you're pretty much spot. Right? And that's that's a pretty common problem. It gets better if you know the tools better. Uh, um, and I think my recommendation would be always have a friend, uh, colleague at hand who has worked with the tool and can you can tell you about all of those invisible barriers of the tool. Another thing is uh, cost explosion, right? And I think, yes, this is a bit like uh, maybe I've not been diligent enough, probably, uh, or we've not been diligent enough. But this is a common situation, like the cost structure, uh, 
and the pricing of those tools, it's there are like one billion bazillion models out there. So you can never know when exactly you need to go to the new tier or the cost increases. Um, there is no real standard yet. And some of the things that happened, you know, yeah, you build your tool uh, and customer support team uh, loves it a lot, right? And then you know, okay, one seat, user seat is $99 Euro, uh, dollars per month. You have a pretty much uh, pretty big customer support team, and they all need to have a user license to be able to use it. Cool, right? And then yeah, go to finance and discuss it. Uh, some other stuff is if your Zap that you built, I don't know, two years ago on a very small database, is triggered by any change in the database, and then it's okay, shut up and take my money. It's it can get very uh, cost intensive because uh, Zapier is paid by like. Uh, how often you the zap is being triggered, right? And this is something, as I said, like you can either you know about it after a certain time or uh, be a bit diligent in uh, uh, choosing and building things on platforms up front. Um, the biggest challenge, I think, is the pain of missing, I'd say, development or engineering standards. And this is something uh, that also ultimately let us at GetSafe in. Um, basically transferring uh, no code and low code ownership from a certain stage onwards into engineering hands because you inevitably you're gonna hit uh, and you're gonna feel all of the pains that I'm just will show you right and the first thing is version control and this happened just several times and uh, there's like bad thing but also a good thing about it right and the good thing i told you about like it's really good to feel all of those pains as a pm uh, at least once in your life because then you know how important it is and you you hopefully listen to your engineers more um about that stuff at least um so version control like most version control um like most tools start without version control at all. They're now all adding it, but most it looks like that, right? So they say, yeah, we have version control. And then version control is basically a number and a description, right? And yes, you can restore old versions, but you mostly have zero idea what actually changed, right? And then it just might happen if you have multiple collaborators on those tools, someone changed something, the whole system uh, is not working anymore. And then the only thing that you can do is you can go back to another version and try to recreate all of the stuff, right? And that might be quite time intensive. Um, monitoring login. And this usually looks like, hey, something didn't work, right? So all tools say, yeah, we have monitoring logging. And what they do is they can tell you that something didn't work. Um, and that's nice, but actually, <laughs> most of the times you want to know like what didn't work, right? And it can be quite painful to get information out of that. Then. Uh, it's it's tests, right? And like literally, I felt the pain of not being able to test edge cases because they usually uh, this is usually when your whole application crashes, and that's the same for uh, like all the applications we know and we've built, like let build uh, by engineers and also no code uh, applications. And yes, most of the tools offers tests, but that it's mostly like okay, we can offer one global test case, cool, right? But what about all the edge cases that? Um, that happen in, in production. And last but not least, and this also happened to me, like is data recovery. I've not seen a tool that really can handle data recovery. So if something serious happens, uh, the information, the data uh, can be can just be lost. Right? And obviously, this, this can be a serious business risk that, uh, and product risk that uh, you, should, you should at least know of if your uh, no-code application has that. Last but not least, uh, and I think that's also something that we experienced in the in the product team at GetSafe. Um, we all know, like, we would love to have more time for vision, strategy, and roadmap. And we felt uh, after successfully implementing a lot of uh, no-code uh, applications or prototypes that then went into production, that those were taking more and more maintenance time, right? And if you built themselves. Um, as, a, as a PM, uh, you're the one who knows about it and needs to go back and see what. Uh, what went wrong, right? So uh, I think this, especially if you're in a more mature organization, uh, this at least um, asset get, uh, get safe, let us to um, 
as I said before, to put the no code ownership from a certain stage onwards, basically in product delivery to uh, to engineering, right? Which has its pros and cons, but it basically makes sure that you as a PM have time to do to focus on the stuff that you should focus on, um, um, but can still use no code as a tool, right, in the team. So, so what? I wanted to come to the end of my talk and uh, want to summarize some takeaways. I think no-code tools can drastically speed up and de-risk product discovery. And in that phase, I think PMs and designers should be in charge. On the other hand, I think no-code can also drastically speed up product delivery, but I think that would be right, my recommendations. Engineers should ultimately be in charge, and you should treat it as just another development tool. Uh, I think what's super important is that as a PM, you make sure that you know about the trade-offs of using such tools, right? The good, uh, good things, and but also the bad things or risks. Um, but ultimately, I think as a PM, as a product person, knowing when and how to use no code can be a real differentiating skill. And I would encourage you all to, if you haven't done so, to uh, get hands on and learn about it. If you want to learn about it, uh, I think the best approach uh, to find the right tool for a task at hand is to just Google it. There are also tons of like lists and directories. I just listed some here um, that are kind of a database of no code tools. And what I found very powerful is asking the network, maybe on LinkedIn or, or similar, um, to ask uh, for people who have might have solved some specific problem and can save you from some uh, pitfalls. And in like when you've chosen a tool uh, or you as a team uh, learning a tool, I think the best thing always is get your hands dirty and build something. It doesn't need to be something big, but just build something. It's the best way to learn. And also, obviously, Googling it. Uh, there are tons of YouTube videos, even Stack Overflow uh, uh, now features no-code, low-code. So uh, you got to find your...